Business has always been about turning a profit, making money. But can it stand for something more? Something beyond dollars and cents? We think so. We think that today, business has a higher calling, a purpose to be fair and just, to do right by their workers, customers, communities, and the environment. And it turns out companies successful doing that also do better for their bottom line. When you see the Just Capital seal, it means this company is a force for good. Visit JustCapital.com to learn more. Good afternoon. We're doing it live right here in the 4 o'clock hour now. Motec on Money, live on the air on 790 KBC, streaming live online worldwide at KBC.com. And your on-demand Motec on Money podcast, KBC.com, Apple iTunes, and all your favorite podcast platforms. And, yes, on the socials, too. Look for us on X, formerly known as Twitter and Instagram. Mixed start to the new week on Wall Street. The Dow taking the spotlight today, racking up another record high close. Investors await new inflation reports due out later this week. The Dow continues to wow up 126 points and marking its 12th record close today of this year so far, 2024, ending at 38,797. The S&P 500 coming off its record high, which we hit on Friday, down just about five points. And the NASDAQ pulling back 48 points. It's uh, just below its uh, all-time high, which was hit back in November of 2021. The S&P 500 rose 1.5% last week, uh, ending above 5,000 for the first time. The Dow eked out a weekly gain of less than 0.1%, while the NASDAQ was the star last week, up 2.3%, as those Tech names continue to rally, including NVIDIA, the AI darling. We're about two-thirds of the way through the fourth quarter earnings season. 76% of companies have beaten the bottom line estimates, according to analyst at Jefferies. Stocks have been moving a lot more than usual after earnings, and we're watching what's happening there. The first big inflation report of this year is coming out. The Consumer Price Index will be coming out this week, and we'll see if inflation gets closer to the Fed's 2% target. In the meantime, uh, interest rates remain at uh, two-decade highs, and it uh, looks like the Fed has delayed plans to uh, cut back on interest rates. So we're waiting to see uh, some news on that. Maybe uh, May. Looks like it's not going to be March. On the earnings front, uh, we see, uh, let's see, shares of big lots plunging 28% after Loop Capital warned investors away from the discount home essentials retailers, citing a precarious financial situation and loss of relevance with consumers. Shares of Abvi moving down about a half percent after that biotech firm lowered its first quarter guidance to reflect the dilutive impact of its closure of the acquisition of Immunogen, according to Market Watch. Rivian, been seeing more of their uh, trucks on the road lately, down about 2% today. A Barclays analyst downgrading that stock to equal weight from overweight in a note to clients while cutting his price target to $16 from $25 and warned that the EV maker's leading technology may not be enough to withstand a challenging environment. Some of these some of these uh, analysts, uh, it sounds like a, a weight loss program, but um, yeah, downgraded the stock to equal weight from overweight. Diamondback Energy making news today. The symbol on that one is FANG, shooting up nearly 10% today. Diamondback and Endeavor Energy Resources today confirmed reports they're combining in a deal valued at about $26 billion. Big merger deal here, including debt, marking the latest big oil merger. Diamondback shares closed up just about 9.5%. Crypto-related stocks and funds rallied today after Bitcoin, get this, rose above $50,000 for the first time. Since December of 2021, before the so-called crypto winter started, as demand for recently launched spot Bitcoin ETFs remains robust. Right now, we see a Bitcoin still above 50,000, down about to 150 here now at 50,040. We're watching uh, what's happening in the uh, crypto world, and um, it looks like among the spot Bitcoin ETFs, Grayscale Bitcoin Trust rose about 5.5% today to close at 4486. We'll be taking a closer look at the crypto prices later this hour. And, of course, watching what's happening on the geopolitical front as well as the political front today. We're watching what's happening with China and also with um, with TikTok getting new attention because uh, President Biden apparently is now using TikTok to the concern of uh, security folks. We'll talk about that and more with China expert Gordon Chang, the author of The Coming Collapse of China and the Great U.S.-China Tech War. Closer to home, we see um, 
Former President Trump now has an 11-point lead over current President Biden on the economy, according to a new Financial Times poll. I'll talk about that, and I'll talk about it with Veronique DeRuji, who is a political economy and senior research fellow at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University, a nationally syndicated columnist. But first, on the record high for the Dow Jones Industrial Average and the whole works tonight, let's bring in money manager Ken Winans, president of Winans Investments, author of Investment Atlas 1 and 2, also Forbes magazine contributor. Ken, thank you very much for taking the call here to kick off uh, the new week on uh, the big news. We see the Dow at a record high of Bitcoin coming to life back above 50K here. Give us your view of things here at the moment. Frank, we, you, you, you skipped the biggest of all the news that came out today. Record amounts of betting on the Super Bowl out of Las Vegas. I'm in Vegas today. I've been oh, there here all go. week on business. But i got to tell you, I've worked on commodity exchange floors. I've been on stock exchange floors. But to be at the sports betting room yesterday at the Westgate Hotel, which was formerly the Hilton, it was amazing, the energy in that place. And rumor has it that somebody lost a huge bet on the overtime play in the Super Bowl. But anyway, uh, you know, it's, it, gambling is actually a very interesting thing, and most economists don't ever talk about it. But it's a gauge on what's going on with the economy, both good and bad. People gamble when they're rich, and people gamble when they're poor. And what I saw yesterday is money was flowing. So very clearly, the, the Vegas economy is doing well. But with all that being said, I think it, it also bodes well that, you know, the people who have had a nice recovery in their stock holdings, uh, there's a sense that real estate might be a bit on the rebound. So it's a broadening effect of investment assets, which is very important if this rally is going to continue. And it started last year when the Federal Reserve said we're done raising rates, and it's continuing on here. But everything that you rattled off before our talk shows signs that things are improving, regardless of how we are in, a, in certainly this election year. And just real quick, we talk about the earnings season. Let me get started on that. The other area that's very interesting to see right now it is actually the real estate sector itself. Uh, a lot of the earnings that have been coming out, people have been wondering, gee, how are the home builders doing? How are the building supply companies doing, the building material companies? And lo and behold, they're all looking as if this spring season is going to be a positive. We have certainly this spring going into the summer, which is the time when the real estate industry typically does well. All those signs point to that even if rates don't come down, the real estate industry has learned how to cope with where rates are at right now. So that was one observation I saw today that really caught my eye on the earnings picture. The other thing, and it's about the inflation scenario, I know we have CPI coming out tomorrow, but I've read a lot of those reports from the companies. And what it seems to me is that if companies have been able to pass on their wage increases, their labor cost, they are doing fine because their bottom line earnings are fine. But companies that have not been able to raise their top line growth and are having to absorb those higher labor costs, they are in trouble. And that seems to be the telltale sign almost across every industry group. On the air live with money manager Ken Winans, uh, and here's another fly in the Chardonnay uh, here, Ken. Uh, I'm sure you must have talked to a lot of folks about this uh, in Vegas. Uh, of course, we should also note, in case uh, you hadn't heard, the Chiefs won the big game over the 49ers yesterday, and Wall Street pays attention, right, Ken, to the uh, Super Bowl because there is something known as the Super Bowl indicator that claims the stock market goes up for the year when the winner of the Super Bowl comes from the National Football Conference, NFC. But when an American football conference team or expansion team wins, uh, the market falls. So uh, with the Chiefs winning, um, are we in for a down year? And how reliable has this uh, indicator uh, been uh, since you're such a, a great uh, market historian? Well, let's put it this way. So since the Chiefs have won three in a row, I guess we'll have to say it's a mixed bag so far. As clearly one year was awful, one year was good, and we'll wait to see how this year plays off. Yeah. Um, but, you know, no, it's true. You have a lot of people, and, you know, there's probably bets going on right now about what the stock market's going to look like this year based on that indicator. Yeah, there's a lot of things. That, and, you know, of course, I, I believe in market seasonality. Uh, it is interesting how they're, we, we do look for – these statistical comparisons to the market. But something like that that was meant to be a lark on Wall Street, many people do follow and, and certainly make uh, gauges on. Uh, Frank, the other thing that, you know, and I think uh, you talked about what was going on with Rivian, and I think it's also important to talk about with Tesla. You know, Tesla is just 
not had a good time for several years now. And, you know, it's just, again, as a money manager, and, you know, what we study in economics and, and numbers, you're also dealing with people and emotions. And I do find that there's a lot of people out there who happen to be Tesla owners or people who drive Teslas who are very, very tempted to jump into the stocks. And I simply tell them, look, don't com- try not to have your emotions pull you one way or the other. You happen to like the car. That's great, but don't let it necessarily dictate your investment strategy. So I just, but I do find it interesting how that seems to be resonating more and more and more with investors as I talk to them. All right. Well, what about the Tesla down? Uh, what about five dollars today? Back to one eighty-eight. What about Tesla? Well, you know, here, here's the thing. It's not just Tesla, and I know that there's there's this. Um, it, it's having kind of a funny identity crisis on what category. Uh, the people at S&P will put it in, whether it's an AI stock or an automotive stock, it's clearly acting much more like an automotive stock right now. I mean, if you weren't to look at certainly any of the automotive companies around the world, uh, they, they have had their ups and downs over the last couple of years, and Tesla seems to be fitting that mold. But, you know, just again, with my opinion, and I'm seeing it, certainly I spend a lot of time in both both ends of California and a certain lot of time in a lot of other places. And, you know, you just continue to hear kind of the same thing over and over again from some people. And these are very much advocates of the technology. There hasn't been a design change in Tesla in years. The cars, you know, you have a lot of the same colors. It's just, I mean, I'm hearing me too stuff. So I think that Tesla is going to have to do what all the other automotive companies do, which is they spend a lot of money every year redesigning their cars, giving new models, giving new perks. And I think that, you know, the, 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 you know that is going to have to happen, I think, for Tesla to have the next run and its leg up on the ladder, which, I mean, they have some very bright, capable engineers. I'm sure they're capable of doing that. But it's clearly time for a change from that perspective. Um, as far as me owning the stock, uh, I'm neutral right now. I would not be a buyer of it. The trend is down. There's other companies I like much better. All right. What about the AI big name NVIDIA hitting uh, new highs today? $722 and change up another dollar fifteen here. NVIDIA up 46% since the start of this year and up 232% over the past year. What about uh, NVIDIA here? Is it going to 800 as uh, one analyst uh, recently uh, called? Well, you know, or they, they used to say on the old street, it's going to Pluto, even though we don't count Pluto as a planet anymore. Here's the thing. Um, the, there's a lot of ways to play the AI situation. And I, I mean, I, although NVIDIA certainly is the most popular of those, and we have those other six companies, but quite frankly, I'm actually looking more at the companies that actually supply the parts and materials and the machinery that allow the chips to be made. So, I mean, as I look at my target list, I mean, you've had some amazing winners. I mean, I'm, I'm looking here at something like LAM Research or analog devices, or, you know, KLAC, these stocks are all up well over 116, 120% in the last 14 months. So here's the point. We all know AI is the real deal. It's the next big rung in the ladder in, in the technology. Certainly everybody up in Silicon Valley, ironically, as it's called, they're all predicting the next big real estate boom up there is going to be driven by AI. What I'm proposing is I actually like to find companies where people don't necessarily know the name and the CEO is not a celebrity. So I would encourage the audience to look for other names that are making money on AI, but they're not necessarily off the tip of the tongue of most investors. And there's certainly a lot of them out there you can look into. All right. Nervous time uh, in the Middle East with all that's happening there. Uh, the price of oil uh, continues to hover near its uh, high point of the year, just below $77 a barrel right now in New York. And is that already starting to move uh, the inflation needle, you think, uh, with that number that's coming out uh, tomorrow? And uh, and what about uh, oil and, and gas and, and uh, those names here? Well, it's interesting. If you were to take a, a statistical study of commodities, it's frank, as I know you know, I'm also a commodity trader. And it's interesting that crude oil in the month of February since 2000, 74% of the time it is up on the month. And on average, the price change of crude is 6%. So to me, it's very much in this, within the seasonal norm of what I, excuse me, of what I expect in crude. But with that, Let's face it. I mean, you just mentioned there's a big merger today that happened, and that was huge because it just produced 
one of the richest oil men on the planet who now happens to be an American, which is very unusual in recent history. But there's a lot of movement right now in crude, certainly in natural gas and in other commodities. February happens to be an incredibly active month for commodities almost across the board. So when you ask the effect of inflation, remember that CPI is a lagging gauge. It, it, it predicts what happened a month ago or two months ago. It's looking at past data. I think we're going to have to be looking at what the Federal Reserve is now trying to gauge, which is going forward. And I dare say that what I mentioned before about wages, certainly what you just mentioned about crude, these are going to weigh on what the Federal Reserve does the rest of the year. I'm still in the camp that the Fed is not going to be dropping rates anytime before the last half of the year for a lot of different reasons, but partly because of what was just discussed here. I think that until we see that wages and the increases in wages, both private and public sector, are not rising in an accelerated rate, I dare say that you're not going to see interest rates drop much. On to your Live with Money Manager, Ken Winans. We've got a big holiday coming up this week, Ken. Uh, Valentine's Day, another big uh, retail holiday. Uh, what about uh, the retailers here? We had uh, Rick Caruso on uh, this show uh, on Friday and talked a bit about uh, what's happening with the economy uh, and consumers and all that coming off a better than expected uh, holiday shopping season. And, uh, looks like some of the retailers uh, aren't doing uh, too well uh, despite uh, that. And what, what's your view of what's happening uh, on the retail front uh, at the moment? You know, I actually think it's funny as we as we look back at, at COVID and going forward, I mean, uh, some of the unsung heroes of, in business happen to be people who, whether they're retailers or they're restauranters, I mean, how they navigated that world as well as they did is quite astounding, both big, certainly big, medium, and small. But here's the thing. I know we like to, we like to beat up on retailers, but, Frank, i got to tell you, at least the list that I'm looking at, which includes Costco's, TJ Maxx, uh, Casey's General Stores, uh, AutoZone, uh, O'Reilly, and certainly, and I'm going to throw restaurants in there like Darden and Texas Roadhouse. When I look at how these stocks have performed in the last 14 months, I see a lot of positives. I mean, Costco's up 58% in the last 14 months. I mean, that is one of the biggest retailers around. So here's my point. I think that the retailers have figured out how to deal with the realities of logistical issues and labor issues. And then, of course, the other one we're going to have to throw in there is Amazon. I mean, it's all in the same camp. I, I happen to think people want to spend money. They, they want to enjoy themselves. Like I said about what I saw in Vegas, people are, are just wanting to have fun again. And I think that this Valentine's Day is going to be a good note of it. And I also think, too, as we go into President's Day weekend, a lot of people are getting out of town. They're lodging. They're going out to restaurants. I know in the case of skiing right now, there's so much snow in Lake Tahoe. Many of my friends in Northern California, man, they're heading to the snow and they're planning to spend an extended weekend. So I think retailers are actually going to have a good year, regardless of what happens with interest rates. All right, Costco getting attention over the weekend or uh, in the last week or so after uh, some woman returned a couch after having it for uh, three and a half years because she simply didn't like it anymore, and they took it back. <laughs> well, I don't, I don't know if you remember, Nordstrom's just had that rule with shoes. They would take back any pair of shoes, regardless of condition, over any period of time. And uh, what I understand is a lot of people took uh, unfair advantage of that. Yeah, co I mean, Costco, clearly, the fact the stock is up 9% on the year so far, they, they, they clearly have the, the market cap to, uh, to honor those kind of requests. You know, Frank, it's, it's very hard right now. Just Again, we're talking about retailers and we're talking about anything that would be in the, 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 the discretionary area. I mean, again, the breadth of this market is actually increasing, not decreasing. And although I was I was very suspect of the rally through much of last year, uh, this thing has some real strength to it. And I think that as we wrap up earnings season, we're going to find there's more good than bad. And really, as far as I'm concerned, people ask me all the time, what's the only thing that could really derail this market? I think if the Fed somehow, some way, see something accelerating and they begin to raise rates again. That's the only thing I can honestly tell you that would keep me up at night worrying about the market. Otherwise, I'm fully invested and continue to look at new names that I might want to jump into. All right. And speaking of that, uh, on the air here with Ken Winans, any specific places where you are putting money now and or taking it off the table? You know, I, I'm going to bring up, I, I'm going to sound like an old broken record, but I, I'm continuing to be amazed at how people are way under, they're way overweighted in tech. And for some strange reason, they are extremely underweighted in retail plays. And I think it's because 
You keep hearing all this bad news about commercial REITs. Well, I agree with you on that. I wouldn't touch those things. But when I'm looking at the home builders, I mean, I'm just a couple of names that I still think they're worth buying even right now. The two that I would take a good luck uh, is at Lennar, which is up 74% in the last 14 months. Think about this. It's a home builder that went up while interest rates are going up. And then my favorite of the bunch is Pulte Homes. It's up 132% in the last 14 months. It's up about 3% on the year. I would look at those two. And then I think you also want to take a good look at some of the companies that actually make building material. And certainly one of them that's a little-known name called Patrick Industries. Uh, I would It's P-A-T-K. It's a smaller company. It's a, it's a little volatile. But again, uh, and I think that you just want to look at anything that's tied to real estate because, as I said, I think that boom through this year is going to go up. And I think these, these stocks clearly have room to run. All right, Ken. Well, thank you very much for taking the call here. That is Ken Winans, Money Manager and President of Winans Investments, author of Investment Atlas 1 and 2, Market Historian, and also Forbes Magazine contributor. Ken, always great to speak with you. Have a wonderful evening and look forward to speaking with you again uh, real soon. Thank you, Frank. Take care. Bye-bye. You too. Thank you very much. Out to the freeways. Now gorgeous evening here on 790 KBC. Folks, you've been hurt and it's time to call a personal injury attorney, but who can you trust? Do your homework. Because not all law firms provide the same care, experience, and results do matter. The Fielding Law Team brings years of expertise, and they're concerned about your well-being. Personal injuries can be overwhelming, but with the right ethical attorney by your side, you can navigate the legal process with confidence. Attorney Clark Fielding and his team of legal sharks prioritize transparency, communication, and results. They've been serving our KABC listeners for years. Fielding Law understands the challenges you're facing, and they're ready to fight for the care, follow-up, and compensation you deserve. Before you decide on an attorney to represent you, do your homework, research your options, check their online reviews, and make sure your attorney has a proven track record in personal injury cases. Fielding Law Firm is not just a legal team. They're your advocates and trusted counselors dedicated to achieving the best possible outcome for your case. For a consultation with the Fielding Law Team, call 833-88-SHARK. That's 833-88-SHARK. Your journey to justice starts with the right choice, Fielding Law Firm, where your case is their commitment. 790 KBC welcomes Il Devo to the Orpheum Theater on July 12th. Tickets are on sale now at Ticketmaster.com. And right now, caller 9 wins at 1-888-795-222. You can get a pair of tickets to the show. Caller 9 wins. Call now, 1-888-795-222. Motaco Money continues here on 790 KBC, a winning day for the stock market. For the Dow, anyway, up 126 points to a record closing high. Getting close to 39,000 now, we're at 38,797. The S&P 500 slipping five points from its record high, which was hit on Friday. Still above 5,000, though, which it hit for the first time on Friday, 5,022 at the close today. NASDAQ down 48 to 15,000. 942. It too also close to its all time high. The yield in the 10 year note now is picked up to 4.19%. This ahead of the consumer price index reading, which we'll be getting first thing tomorrow morning. Big day for uh, the cryptos. We see Bitcoin popping above 50,000 for the first time in a couple of years. Bitcoin right now down about 150 at 50,040. Ethereum up 27 at 2,658. And Doge at 8 cents. NVIDIA continues on a roll. Of a dollar fifteen to seven twenty two forty eight, of forty six percent just since the start of this year. Tesla down five and change to one eighty eight thirteen. Apple down nearly two at one eighty seven fifteen. And now the latest news here in seven ninety KBC. Moteca money continues here in seven ninety KBC. Coming off the wires from New York City. The Associated Press is reporting one person was killed and five others wounded in a shooting at a New York City subway station this evening at the start of the evening rush hour. The gunfire in New York City broke out in an elevated train platform in the Bronx at around 4.30 New York time when stations throughout the city are filled with kids coming home from school and many workers are beginning their evening commute. A man in his 30s was killed, according to New York City police. A fire department spokesman described four of the other injuries as serious. Police were not immediately able to provide details on what happened, but said a hunt was on for the shooter who fled the scene. Again, this is coming to us from New York. One person dead, five others wounded in a shooting incident at a New York City subway station this evening. 
Motac on Money continues here on 790 KBC. Watching what's happening with the economy. We'll be getting an important reading on inflation. First thing uh, tomorrow morning, the consumer price index uh, will be coming out. Looks like uh, inflation getting the attention of uh, President Biden based on that video. He uh, talked about uh, shrinkflation, says that it has to stop. In the meantime, it looks like, according to a Financial Times poll, President Trump is getting better marks than uh, President Biden when it comes to the economy. Joining us live now is Veronique DeRuji, George Gibbs Chair in Political Economy and Senior Research Fellow at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University, also nationally syndicated columnist. Veronique, thank you very much for taking the call here. First of all, tell us uh, about this uh, new uh, survey that's out showing uh, former President Trump well ahead of uh, current President Biden on uh, matters when it comes to uh, the economy. Good evening. Thank you for having me. I mean, it's not surprising, right? Um, I mean, like, well, they're just, I had my issues with President Trump, and, and in particular with the excessive amount of spending uh, during his presidency. I mean, the economy was growing, wages were going up uh, when he was before the pandemic. And uh, and so a lot of people were happy with what was happening. And since then, um, it's not that the economy hasn't been growing. It's not that unemployment isn't low, but the economy has been battered and the consumer has been really hurt seriously by inflation, which has grown like the cost of shelter since 2021 by like, 40 percent, the price of food by 20 percent, the price of milk by 18 percent. I mean, there's just it's just quite significant uh, for people. And uh, and there's just a lot of uncertainty. So while the economy is growing, unemployment is low, it's just like people aren't ha- happy. So I guess this is probably what these polls are expressing. Let me take a look. Uh, I just pulled up the uh, Financial Times uh, survey showing that more Americans trust Donald Trump to handle the U.S. economy than President Joe Biden. Overall, 42 percent of Americans said they felt former President Trump would be better, a better steward for the economy, with 31 percent choosing Biden, 21 percent saying they trusted neither candidate, according to the Financial Times University of Michigan Ross School of Business survey. So uh, the bottom line is uh, more Americans trusting uh, former President Trump to handle the economy than the uh, the current president, despite all this talk about how how great the economy is here at the moment. Yes. And the, the other thing that's worth noting is, you know, for all the talk of Bidenomics, I think people are not fooled by the fact that Bidenomics amounts to favors to unions, favors to big corporations in semiconductor and the green energy business. And and I think kind of like people just you know they realize what's going on and they they just they're not buying it and and I think they're right right to be and let's also not forget that the the price of of uh, borrowing money has gone up quite dramatically and and there's there's uh, people also also sense that a lot of that spending even though the president uh, all, all of that inflation um, is not contrary to what the president would like us to believe due to the greed of corporations, but it's because of all the spending he's been doing. On the live with Veronique DeRuji, and let me ask you this. You mentioned it, uh, inflation. We'll, get, we'll be getting a new reading on that uh, tomorrow, and, and while the president complains about how many ounces of potato chips are in a bag of snacks, uh, uh, we are obviously dealing with other big issues that are fueling inflation. Uh, of course, energy uh, back in focus, but also uh, with what's happening, um, interest payments on the federal debt and, and certainly interest payments on what uh, people are paying on their credit cards, which are at record highs now. And of course, mortgage rates also uh, uh, higher than they were certainly uh, in recent years. Um, what about uh, all of that? Well, so inflation is in this case, the product of um, the enormous amount of spending paired with the fact that for the first time ever, the, the administration in charge overseeing an emergency and the response to an emergency, at least part of it, has not said and, 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 and reassured investors that all this money that we borrowed at, uh, for the, to respond to the emergency will be repaid. 
If you remember during the Great Recession, President Obama was really, really eager to remind people that we're spending a lot of money now, but we will be um, we'll be reducing the deficit by half in the next five years. We had a big debate, national debate over austerity. That was has been the case for all the emergencies before. It's a it's in it's an implicit uh, fiscal rule, and this president hasn't done any of that. Not only has we not, have we not been talking about austerity, but on top of that, the president has actually tried to make all these temporary programs permanent. And I think this is the reason why inflation broke out. It's fiscal inflation fueled mostly by the fact that there's no people are right to kind of worry that maybe they're not going to be repaid. And so where, how does interest on the debt factor in all this. When the, Federal Re- when the Federal Reserve fights inflation by raising interest rates, right? first it shouldn't be doing it alone. It should actually, we forget that even in the, uh, in the 80s, Volcker, uh, Chairman Volcker did raise interest rates a lot, but President Reagan actually did a lot of fiscal consolidation in the eight years that he was in office. And there's been none of that coming from Congress, that's for sure. And in, in addition, higher interest rates mean higher interest payment. Quite dramatically, we've gone from paying interest on the debt at the tune of roughly $400 billion in 2022 to last year. It was well over, it was six $669 billion, and this year is going to be a trillion dollars. And that money, we don't have. So it means we have to borrow it. And so we're adding borrowed money on top of borrowed money, and and that is not good for inflation. And it's not – inflation has gone down, um, you know, quite significantly, but prices are still up, and people know that. And And as long as Congress and the president don't help the Federal Reserve, I don't know that interest – that inflation is going to be really um, going back to, to – down to target, that is, 2%. All excellent points, uh, Veronique. Thank you very much for taking the call here. And uh, you remember, uh, as I do, when uh, the question of how are we going to pay for this uh, was asked, uh, doesn't seem to be asked anymore. Veronique de Rougy, George Gibbs Chair in Political Economy and Senior Research Fellow at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University, also nationally syndicated columnist. We'll be looking for your next column. Veronique, thank you very much uh, for coming to the line here this afternoon. Thank you for having me. Right out to the freeways now, 790 KABC. Odeca Money continues here on 790 KBC. Good afternoon. We're doing it live in the 4 o'clock hour, doing it more in 2024. In the 4 o'clock hour live here on 790 KBC, streaming live online worldwide, too, at kbc.com and the on-demand Motaka Money podcast, kbc.com, and all the podcast platforms. Well, President Biden giving uh, new attention to TikTok, getting on TikTok, even though uh, he banned its use on government devices. There's a... Uh, Concerned about that. Also, did you hear about this fury over the Chinese-owned Timu for running six ads during the Super Bowl over the weekend? Some lawmakers say Congress uh, needs to look into this. Let's bring in Gordon Chang now, China expert and author of The Coming Collapse of China and the Great U.S.-China Tech War, and on Twitter, or now X as it's known, at Gordon G. Chang. Gordon Chang, thank you very much for taking the call here. First of all, on this uh, big uh, TikTok story, uh, give us your reaction to this uh, big news here. Well, President Biden should not have gone on TikTok um, because it is a national security threat. Not only have the Chinese violated every promise on data security, more important, China uses the app um, and the algorithm that curates content um, to propagate its messages, such as disinformation on the Ukraine war, uh, promotion of illegal drug use in the United States, all sorts of attempts to create divisions in American society. And we should be banning TikTok or at least expropriating it, not promoting its use by the president of the United States. Looks like his reelection campaign uh, officially launched uh, its TikTok uh, account, uh, trying to make him look younger, right? Well, yes, and, and more capable. I mean, it's not so much the question of age. His likely opponent is about the same age as him. But it's the issue of mental acuity and his ability to discharge the job, especially after the special counsel's report that essentially said that the president should not stand trial for clearly violating the law because of 
almost diminished capacity. Didn't quite say that in those terms, but did say that he couldn't get a jury to convict because he looked uh, the part of being an elderly man and actually um, substantiated uh, some very important mental slips. It was just, uh, what, about a year ago that the Biden administration itself warned that TikTok uh, could face a, a ban here in the U.S. if its parent company, ByteDance, did not sell its stake in the U.S. version of the app. And it should be noted that uh, TikTok uh, by far is the most popular social media at the moment, right? Well, it's uh, on the phones of something like 160, 570 million Americans. So that's extremely popular. You're basically talking about half the American population has TikTok on their phone. And we know that China uses it for malicious purposes. So there's no excuse for allowing TikTok to continue under Chinese ownership. And the, the concern here is um, not only uh, for uh, President Biden's uh, cybersecurity, but um, consumer data also uh, it was recently flagged right at, at risk because uh, Chinese law requires Chinese companies to share information with the with the communist government there yes article 7 and 14 of the 2017 national intelligence law requires every chinese entity to supply and commit actually acts of espionage if they receive a demand from the relevant authorities so clearly this is dangerous for us and we have known um, that tiktok has violated its promises on data security and recently when china uh, tiktok ceo was before congress I believe he actually committed perjury um, because he said that no data had ever been transferred to China, but there is sufficient evidence to show that, in fact, it had. And so there should be a perjury charge uh, laid against him. Very interesting. Uh, and it should be noted the White House spokesman was asked about this and, and referred everybody to the campaign. Meanwhile, the White House itself last year mandated that federal agencies remove TikTok from phones and uh, government systems. Yes. Um, the thing is that, uh, in addition, President Trump, in his last days in office, actually used his powers under the International Emergency Economic Powers Act of 1977 um, to ban TikTok and WeChat in the U.S. And one of the first things that President Biden's Justice Department did was to drop efforts to prosecute that ban in federal court. So really what we have seen is a known danger the Biden administration has allowed it to continue um, and to actually continue to take data from Americans and to propagate Chinese narratives, which are dangerous to the U.S. Very interesting. Well, if you want to get uh, attention, you, you run an ad during the Super Bowl. But how about six ads? This uh, Chinese owned uh, Timu online um, platform um, really went all out at the Super Bowl uh, this uh, past weekend. Uh, searches for the e-commerce company. Um, including uh, what is Timu, I understand, uh, have uh, skyrocketed uh, after the company uh, aired uh, commercials. Tell us about the Timu and uh, what we need to know about it. Well, Timu is an online platform that is hoping to compete with Amazon. It is um, owned um, by a Chinese company. And here the question, going back to TikTok, is data security. Again, um, the Communist Party or the Chinese central government can demand that Timu um, provide data on Americans to the party. And I'm sure that that's, that is happening in any event. Um, the issue here for the United States is that Timu's packages come in duty-free under the de minimis exception uh, in the Tariff Act of 1930, as it was amended in 2015. So they can bring in $800 per person per day duty-free. And that gives Timu an unfair advantage over companies like Amazon. Very interesting. Uh, and if President Trump uh, regains office, you think that'll change? I think that uh, whether or not President Trump gain, uh, regains office, it will change because there is um, bipartisan support to look at the de minimis exception, especially in connection with Timu and the other Chinese company, Xin. Thank you very much, Gordon Chang, China expert and author of The Coming Collapse of China and the Great U.S.-China Tech War, and on X, formerly known as Twitter, at Gordon G. Chang. Gordon, thank you very much for taking the call here this afternoon. Thank you, Frank. Motec on Money continues here on 790 KBC. We've closed out the day with the Dow at an all-time high, recapping the action on Wall Street. The Dow up 126 points today, settling at 38,797, an all-time high for the blue-chip index. 
The S&P 500 slipping five, coming off its all-time high. We're back to 5,022. Yep, still above 5,000. We hit that for the first time last week. The NASDAQ down 48 at 15,942. This is Motec on Money on 790 KBC. Stay tuned now for the 790 KBC News Blitz with Randy Wang here on 790 KBC. Hey, it's Rich Eisen here. Join me and my compadre, Chris Brockman, every Monday on the Overreaction Monday podcast as we dive into the latest headlines across the NFL playoffs. Are you ready, Chris Brockman? Just as handsome as ever, buddy. I appreciate you saying that, and I wish I could say the same to you. There is a ton to overreact to, as now every other team that didn't make the playoffs, they're already looking forward to next year. Come react or overreact with us leading up to the big game. Overreaction Monday, wherever you listen.